Today we're talking about a new film from horror director Frank Calfoon, who was the man behind P2 and loads of other horrors. It's a new thriller, horror thriller, uh, called Night of the Hunted, which is coming out on Shudder and also on uh, cinema release as well, selected cinemas. But look who's here, Matt in the US, and we've got Chris in London in the UK. I'm in London as well, my name is Phil. Welcome back to Boys on Film. Guys, Night of the Hunted. Well, it's a pretty simple plot line. A woman is taking a trip. I think she's a businesswoman coming from a convention. They don't say where it is, somewhere in America, maybe California. And she's driving overnight with a co-worker of hers who also secretly is her lover on the side. She's married. And they have to stop off at a gas station to get gas and food and assorted things. So they pull over to this gas station in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, and they seem to be the only people there. And then the woman goes into the station to pay and buy things. And she realizes not only is no one there, the woman behind the counter was shot. And so she sees blood splattered everywhere. And before she can leave the station to go back to the car, she gets shot and we soon find out, no spoilers really, that her partner gets shot as well. So the rest of the film is about how she tries to escape this unseen sniper who's trying to kill her and anyone else who comes to that station. Well summed up. And I've got to say, it's pretty much centred in that gas station, isn't it? I mean, there's a couple of outside shots, which are obviously pivotal to the story. um, And it kind of cranks up the tension a little bit having those other shots. But it is essentially in one room. And to a certain extent, I think there is tension there. I think they make the most of probably what they've got. I mean, I'm guessing it's a relatively low budget film. They don't need anything expensive i mean there are some special effects which are quite good um with makeup you know, one thing i really enjoyed about it that, that you know we enjoy about a lot of horror films and it's kind of central to our enjoyment of them as an audience is that whole kind of trying to get out of a situation you know you can you, you we see more as the audience don't we generally so there's always this kind of weird tension building between what the characters are tra- experiencing and what they're trying to escape from and what we understand of it, what we what we can see of it. And I quite liked the kind of rhythm of that. You know, there were quite a lot of little situations where you're like, you're screaming at the sc- screen going, just, you know, do this, do that, set fire to that, throw that at him, you know, do these things. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that's I was doing that. And, you know, Obviously, yeah. being a good movie, she didn't do any of those things. No, anyway. I know. They, they never do, though, do they? <laughs> I was screaming at the screen for different reasons, though. I got, I got this real sense of kind of entrapment and um, actually kind of sort of claustrophobic, agoraphobic kind of thing because of the darkness. You know, you're in the middle of nowhere in this this one little tiny building with all this horrible artificial light in it until the light goes out. And it's just really claustrophobic. It's really I felt quite trapped. I kind of got this real sense of claustrophobia and agoraphobia about it. And, you know, when you added in this kind of frustration and tension about the situation she was in and, you know, w- willing her to, I don't know, throw a, throw something at him or whatever I was shouting at the TV, um, you know, it just it just compounded into this quite anxious kind of thing for me, which was, which was good. I enjoyed that. And she does come up with a few tricks to kind of avoid the sniper i mean at one point she she finds lots of umbrellas in because obviously she's surrounded by food and medicine and she uses the medicine i mean there's a a laughable scene with um (laughs) hand sanitizer and glue which she uses on an injury which had me howling because i thought that was hilarious i mean i I don't know whether that was the next time i'm stuck at a gas station with a sniper shooting at me i will be using that technique to repair my injuries that looked like a good technique but that's one thing i liked about this movie and kind of movies like this where you as the viewer can put yourself into the position like what would i do if i was in this like would i would i do that move she did or would i do this would i do this and that kind of ratchets up the excitement uh as a viewer as opposed to just being a passive viewer in something where you could never imagine yourself in yeah there is some good gore though i mean we mentioned this earlier about the well chris you sent me a message saying about <laughs> i'm not gonna say anything because it will spoil it but a certain squishing action <laughs> yeah there's, there's a climactic the squishing that's how i'm gonna refer to it, the climactic squishing and i you know that was nasty yeah you know what do you want for your money 
<laughs> it was pretty grim. And the villain, I mean, let's talk about the story. Let's talk about the, the lead, actually. Uh, that's probably one of the problems I've got with it. I don't want to single her out completely. Her, her name is uh, Camille Rowe. I think she was a girlfriend of Harry Styles at one point. I think she inspired one of his albums. I think they went out mm. a few years ago. But she's um, she plays the lead. She plays Alice. I wasn't that convinced by her performance myself. I don't know what, what you guys thought. Um, <laughs> I think she was better towards the end. The, the last half, the final act, I think she she seemed to excel more. But I think the, she just annoyed me. What did you think, Matt? Because actually, I kind of thought, I bought into her sort of middle class you know, early middle age, you know, fairly comfortable kind of life, you know, frustrated by this terrible inconvenience of being shot at in a gas station, you know, and I got her frustration. I got her kind of, her annoyance at that, you know, she just got annoyed with that sometimes. She was just like, my life normally goes how I want it. And then suddenly this guy's shooting at me and that's annoying me. You know, I, I kind of got that. I empathized with that. I mean, not that I've been shot at very many times, but you know, I, I empathize with that. I mean, I can see both of your points. She was annoying, but I think you're supposed to think she's kind of a privileged yeah. white woman, businesswoman who can kind of get, gets what she wants and everything sails by. So when she's inconvenienced, it's, it's a little bit like, well, is she really a hero or not? But then when you start getting involved in all these action sequences and all this, where she's shot at, threatened, all this stuff, just as a viewer, no matter who she is, you're kind of behind the heroine or the hero of the story. And so you want her to survive because you know the person against her is evil. So you don't really want him to win out in the end, I don't think. I mean... Maybe some people do, but that's kind of the crux of the whole movie, I think, is these two opposing sides kind of butting heads where she's this kind of like a political, just like upper middle class businesswoman. And the villain is this working class, apparently right wing, anti-vax, anti-woke, whatever you want to call it, ideology. And so it's kind of a fight between those two things, which is... I don't know. I don't think that's that's the one part of the movie I don't think really works well. Yeah. Because I think there's, and I think I'm assuming you guys are also going to believe this is true that there was too much dialogue in the film, not about what was going on physically in the space, but dialogue about, well, if your politicians did this, why aren't you do do do? Or like you caused this to happen because you don't believe in our way of life, whatever. It became yeah. a political dialogue between each other I, I think maybe it just got a bit muddy in in yeah. all that dialogue because I don't, I don't think the dialogue was the the strongest part of the film i think there was a lot of tension which i thought was good that was one of the good points i'm gonna say that i kind of the muddiness actually was was good for me actually because it was trying you know the she was having this real frustration with like what does this man want from me why am i here why is he doing this and, you know, he'd try and explain, you know, it's because society is against him and all, all that kind of stuff that you've just been talking about. And it was still pretty difficult for us as an audience, I think, and for her to understand what he was after, you know. And I think that that was, OK, that might just be muddy, clumsy writing, but it, it, it worked for me, actually, because it was there was a kind of, you know, a, an opacity about what it was that his mission was that she was really struggling with that I just empathise with because I didn't know either really what he yeah, wanted. Yeah, that, that's about. interesting. I think there's definitely a red herring in the plot as part of the plot though with regards to why the villain is doing what he's doing because I think to a certain extent I, I kept thinking is this the writer's intention that this is his political stance what he's trying to put across his frustration with his viewpoint on politics or is it his frustration with how society is at the moment and and the kind of black and white you know divide that we have you're either one way or the other and there's no kind of common ground with discussions i don't know whether that i was just a bit confused by that i don't know whether it was him trying to prove a point or then trying to prove a point or whether we were meant to kind of have our own ideas of what was going on well like you said phil in a way there was a red herring because you think it's this kind of um, random by chance meeting of these two people, but then he starts saying that he knows her name and that he yeah. knows her situation, followed her from the convention. But 
how does he know that specifically that much about her? And if he does, he kind of eventually kind of stops talking about that. And then it becomes just like, well, I'm going to kill anyone who comes to the station. So it becomes like, which is which side is he on specifically to get her as a person or to get anyone that he feels like because he's angry? Like it gets muddled and that kind of, I wonder what kind of a film it would be like if you never really knew why he was doing this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he just was like, he was, yeah. Yeah. Simple and he was just doing that. Maybe, and there was less dialogue in the film. That might be yeah. a really interesting play in a film. I think I would have really enjoyed it so much more if if it was so like too. that. Yeah, I think there was a lot that was problematic for me. And it was holding me back. And it was frustrating me as a viewer as well. Because I kept thinking, I really like, I like the feel of it. I like the tension. I like the way the action is playing out. And, you know, that whole kind of what would I do if I was in that situation and she's doing sometimes the complete opposite of what I would have done, but also having some really smart ideas as well, like with the umbrellas to hide herself. But yeah, I mean, that was the problem for me. And also, just quickly, I've got to mention one of the main problems for me was that we don't really know much about her at the beginning. And I think as soon as the action starts, and it does start pretty much at the beginning, I think probably five or ten minutes in. So it gets mm -hmm. straight into it, straight into the action, wham, bam. But you don't really know much about her. So for me, I didn't really care. Like, I know that sounds awful. I didn't really care whether she survived or not because I didn't have her... I didn't understand her character. So I didn't feel like... I mean, yes, I don't want any human to die, like in a real situation. But on the screen, I think it's different. I think you need to feel feel the character. Yeah, I, know, I know what you're saying, but actually I quite liked that complexity in her because... You know, like you say, you, 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 you have a little debate with yourself about whether you want her to survive this or not, really. And, you know, I actually think, you know, we're all quite complicated. Yes, I agree. This is a film and this is fiction. And this, you know, we've got to, we're, we're telling a story here. and We need to be a little more binary, a little more uh, storytelling about it. But I quite liked the kind of the forcing together of the personal and the political here in, a, in quite an uncomfortable way, in a way that, you know, she doesn't deal with very well. You know, it's, it's difficult to tell what her history is and why she's so affected by this and why she reacts the way she does. It's difficult to understand his motivations. And I genuinely, I quite liked that muddying because it's actually a pretty simple plot. You know, woman gets stranded in service station, man shoots at her, you know, and, and you know, disaster ensues. You know, pretty simple plot line. So you can afford to have some of the tangle and the muddiness and the complication around that to make it just a little more opaque and a little bit more sort of uh, engaging, I think, really. We keep seeing flashes of the billboard behind, outside as well, the massive billboard which says, God is nowhere. And I thought that was quite interesting. because we... No, does it say that, though? God is now here. The fact is it said both. I mean, there was ambiguity there, you know, and I think that's... Look, I mean, look, let's look at all film school on this. You know, if, if we're talking about opacity in this and a kind of lack of clarity, it's right there in massive 18-foot letters on the billboard. It says, God is now here or God is nowhere, depending on which way you're looking at it. And you've just got these different ways to interpret it. And I think, actually, that's a very clever device, yeah. like I say, getting all film students on you, for the film, actually, because the film is hard to read in those weird ways as well. It's hard to be clear about things. And I quite like that. Did you like the ending, Matt? Over to you first. Um, but, um, so is it is it a happy ending? Is it a sad ending? I don't. It's kind of neither. It's just kind of a little bit of a nihilistic kind of ending. Yeah. I if, if it wasn't for the fact that the the road that she that the girl runs along is tarmac, it would have looked like you know the Wizard of Oz Yellow Brick Road. I mean, she skips <laughs> along at the end, you know, like gaily, you know, truly gaily. And I think that's probably the bit that Phil's complaining about. I didn't totally get that. I mean, you've just you've just spoiled it, so I'm going to go with your spoiler. <laughs> you know, I had to be slumped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do that all of the time, Phil, as well. You know. I think it's it's a slightly weird ending. You kind of, you know, when you're watching these kind of films that are so claustrophobic and so sort of tense, tension filled, you need some relief at some point. You've got to let the pressure valve off at some point. Either that just means the credits just roll or a girl skips along a piece of tarmac at the end. And, you know, they chose the tarmac option. And that's just one way of doing it, isn't it? Actually, listening to your comments, this made me appreciate the film more. Not that I'm going to upgrade my score or anything, but yeah, it's quite interesting. It's good to talk about, I think, this film. Yeah, oh yeah. 
It's provoked some thought. You know, I, I thought about it the next day, actually, in, in that way that you don't always. You know, sometimes you see a movie, you love it when you're experiencing it, it, it does all these things to you, and then you, however much you loved it in the moment, you just don't think about it ever again. I did think about this the next day, not because I was going on any road trips or, you know, <laughs> shooting anybody from a billboard, but, you know, I just it was just in my mind, you know, it was just there, and it did leave a bit of an impression. It's, okay, not like you know, a great classic. But, you know, it did leave a... It left a mark. Quick question for you both before we do the star rating. Uh, I know it's a big horror trope, isn't it? The Scream Queen. I mean, some of my favourite films feature the Scream Queen. Halloween, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, obviously, as Laurie Strode. We've had, you know, similar situations with this same director, Frank Calhoun, who did P2. Similar situation with, with regards to an isolated female element in the movie and of course this is an isolated female uh, at risk at peril is it time to move on from that i love it when they come out on the end and they're the final i mean the final girl that's a, a trope already but i'd rather have a, a final girl than a final boy it's just more interesting because it's supposed to be that the woman's in peril and what what are you supposed to think do you want her to be killed at the end or kidnapped or whatever do you want her to beat all the evil men and be the last person standing. I want that. And I think yeah. that's much more, it's still an interest. It's been done since, I mean, when was Halloween 45 years ago? And it's yeah. still, it's still, people can still pull it out and make a good ending with it. And I, I, I think guess they should a slightly uncomfortable thing for me about her in that regard is that there's a pretty old fashioned moralistic, she's being punished because she was having an affair you know, she, she has a conversation um, with her husband or her partner while she's in the car with the guy she's having an affair with and she's lying to him about some fertility treatment or something. I think she's going through full of hope about their future together. And clearly it's massively deceitful and, you know, that's a bit uncomfortable. And, you know, it, it, you know in, in, in its entirety, therefore, you know, is, is she being punished for her kind of in a moral way for her behaviour. And I'm not very comfortable with that because, you know, that's slot shaming basically. And she can do what she likes. She can do what she likes. Um, and, you know, and I'm cool with that. And uh, unfortunately, you know, putting into the situation is a kind of, can be seen as her just desserts for that. So I'm less comfortable with that than I am with just the fact that there is a scream queen, to be honest. I'll give it three stars. I would do three and a half, but we don't do halves here. So I think three is fair. I, I, I liked it. I, it wasn't the best thing I've seen in horror, but it was pretty decent. I liked it. I liked the setup. I liked the tension of the two person, basically two person act play. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And Chris, I'm guessing that your star rating is going to be even higher. Might be. Is it five? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a four because it wasn't the best film I've ever seen, but it's better than a lot. I liked even though it's not a minimalist film in terms of its dialogue and all those kind of things, there's something quite simple about it that I respect and I like. You know, it's got a straightforward plot, it's a pretty simple thing. Yes, I agree it got a bit muddied, but I think that's a device actually. I think that was a deliberate thing. And on, on that basis, on the benefit of the doubt, I'm gonna say four because I think, you know, it's a good film that I I enjoyed. You know, we we turned it off and we went, we enjoyed that. That was good. So Okay. Well I, I think this is probably the first review we've ever done where there's three of us, where we've all got, got a different rating, got different score. Yeah. I go for two. I go for two because there are so many elements in it that frustrated me that I didn't like. Like I say, wasn't too keen on the act, actor, the, the main, main actress that played um, Alice. But I haven't seen her in anything else, so I can't really judge it on whether it's her. I don't want to be personal and say it's her her fault but i just didn't enjoy watching her performance but you just did i think you made some very valid points but it wasn't enough sadly sorry guys i'm very happy you both enjoyed it night of the hunted it comes out on shutter and it's also in select cinemas as well from the 20th of october i think we're getting a uh, on demand release as well um so you can watch it at home from the 20th of november let us know if you've seen it drop a comment down down below guys always good to see you thank you so much for your very valid comments and input into this review and we'll be back soon to chat about more delicious horrors in time for halloween